sixpence if that's what I have to do. Wait just a minute. Uh, a couple of questions I'd like to ask you, if you don't mind. The first time that I ever got a look at you, as a matter of fact, I rather think the first time that most people ever saw your face, you were sitting across a table very much like this in a film called Dr. No, and suddenly the camera came on and, and uh, you identified yourself. You gave your name as James Bond. Mm. And from that moment on, you were James Bond through, what, five films now, all smashed successes. How much longer are you going to go on being James Bond, do you think? Well, I suppose as long as they keep releasing them and re-releasing them in their permutations, but uh, I've done five now over six years, and that's it. I've finished. Completely. You're not going to be James Bond anymore? No, I'm afraid not. Well, do you think you can escape this, this character? You've gotten so far into it, and your face is James Bond to so many people, I'm wondering if you'll be accepted as somebody else. Well, yes, I have played other parts before I uh, started the, the um, Bond films, and I've played... Uh, many other parts intermittently between them. Um, it's a problem because I don't think any other actors had such a sort of exposure in the, in the world, as in this case. I mean, it's like some sort of Frankenstein. But uh, I, th I really think that, that uh, now is uh, as big as they can go and as grand as they can go and, what is it, $10 million it costs to make. And I think that's a, as good a time as any to sort of uh, leave the scene, as it were. Well, while you were making the Bond films, you made, let's see, you made The Hill, mm. and you made A Fine Madness. Both of them, yeah. good pictures, both were well-reviewed, but none of them could touch a Bond film at box office. They, they just yeah. didn't turn out the profit. Now, do you think that's an indication that you uh, are locked into James Bond for life? Uh, well, I'm certainly not locked into it for life, but uh, is this a thing one has to be realistic about? There's no doubt about it that this um, Bond phenomena you know, it's never happened in the uh, history of the cinema before. So, I mean, I have to uh, fight it, as it were, on its own terms. Uh, I go on doing uh, other films which have had good reviews, um, haven't made anything like a comparable am amount of money, but uh, that shouldn't and never would stop me from making another picture. Um, I, don't, I think there's lots of other films that have been marvelous films that haven't made any money and uh, I think I have to um, or I know I have to keep a sort of a balance my own particular balance about what I think is good and what I think is bad uh, and I think that the other films I've made apart from the Bond films have been good some couple very good others not so good but um, to use the Bond uh, box office return as a a comparison is um, um, a madness. A fine madness, perhaps. Well, Sean, there was a character, James Bond. He was created by Ian Fleming, as everybody knows. He was one of the favorites of President Kennedy. And yet, the character never really took shape, never had any personality until you stepped onto the screen and became James Bond. Now, you must have met Ian Fleming. Did you sit down with him and have long talks about what you should be, what you should do? Who, who decided how you should act? Uh, well, it's, uh, that's like about sort of ten questions in, in one. Let me try and answer. Um, in the first instance, the character of Bond was very well known to many people who read the books and had a very definite opinion, all quite different. For example, the lock of hair and blue eyes to some and cruel to others and, and non-sadistic to others and an athlete, you know, many, many dimensions. Um, so therefore, he had that sort of success before I even touched it or even read. I've read two of the books. And Fleming had this fantastic value. Uh, then when I became involved with the films, uh, in the first instance, I felt that there was a lack of humor about them. And um, when I raised this point with Ian, uh, who I became quite friendly with and I admired tremendously. Uh, what I admired more than anything else about Fleming was his curiosity. Mm. It's tremendous curiosity about everything. Um, when I mentioned the, the business of uh, humor, he was uh, quite surprised because he felt he was quite humorous. He was, as a, as a man, humorous, Ian himself. But in writing, the character of Bond, he wasn't. And that was one of the first things that one had to do was to uh, um, imbue a, a humorous aspect to all the, um, on a realistic basis. Therefore, one would get uh, a sort of 
upbeat ending to scenes and situations, therefore they could acknowledge and accept the violence if it had a, a humoresque quality. Well, you know, I can remember very vividly one of those scenes. It seems to me that it was in the first picture, Dr. No, and somebody had come in to uh, <clears throat> rub you out in the vernacular and, and succeeded in emptying his gun into a pillow which you'd arranged, uh, whereupon you said, that's six, old boy, or whatever the line was, and promptly shot him through the head. Now, there was a humor in that, if it can be humor in eradicating humans. Where did that come from? Did you think it up, or the director, or was well, it Well, first of all, I didn't shoot him through the head. It's just kind of interesting, actually, that you should think oh. that I shot him through the head. But uh, because when he was lying down, he was shot, uh, the blood was through the front and the blood was on the back. Anyway, that's irrelevant. But that's what the cinema does. It suggests so many things. Um, uh, you've had your six, I said, actually. And uh, that was a line that I uh, dreamt up, as I did in many instances, in all the scripts, and uh, had most license with uh, Terence Young, who directed the first two and the fourth. Um, these sort of quip lines, or what I'm talking about, that sort of humorous. Would you add these in as you went along? Yeah, well, we had, we had to because lots of times, you know, in the screenplay, they are impractical, the scenes. I mean, they might read well, and then when you get into the situation, as the, the, the people or the characters involved in a fight or what have you in a scene, suddenly the uh, dialogue uh, doesn't fit anything or anything like how it's been conceived by the art director. So they have to improvise. Yeah, and change it, you know, and lift it and lay it and and find uh, something that was, and always trying to get something that's a bit funny. I mean, for example, one of the lines we used um, in You Only Live Twice, I think it was, uh, the things I do for England, I said, in one scene with one of the girls, is a direct steal by, uh, from Charles Lawton in Henry VIII, which uh, we were going to use in Thunderball when Luciana Bellucci was going to take my shirt off in the bathroom and I had to see the things I do for England and... Uh, As if it were a sacrifice. Yeah, that's right. Yes, and uh, so we cut it because we were taking it from another film, but we used it anyway. I suppose you got hazardous duty pay for making love to all those gorgeous women. Huh? Well, it's only in a sort of celluloid fashion. Yeah. Well, you know, a fair question is, did Sean Connery make James Bond or did James Bond make Sean Connery? Now, do you feel that the actor fitting into a scene like this, where there already is a fantastic character waiting to be filled, contributes a large amount of originality, or are you pretty much ushered through the scenes like a puppet? <coughs> no, I think a lot of, um, I use a lot of myself in making the, uh, the films. I mean, after all, if it's a character is written merely in uh, a book, uh, to come in then as an actor, you, in anything, you know, any play, you, you start to fill in the bones with a, a flesh character. Uh, in this instance, one had a, a very good opportunity to, to go on because it had never been done before, this type of character, so sort of cool and suave and uh, sophisticated with humor. And to be able to do so many things, not just appear to be able to do them, but to do them. and. Um, I don't know, it's... Uh... I sometimes think that, that the character of Bond was made when you gave a, a, a twist of a smile or a glance of an eye, and I suppose this is the kind of contribution that you had to fill in that was not in the book, that somebody had to bring to life. Is that a fair statement, do you think? Uh, yeah, also the way it was shot. The first one, I think, was shot very well under the circumstances, the time we had and what have you. I think Terence Young really directed it marvelously. And then I think the second one really started to find... I think the second one is the best of them all. That's only my... Opinion. After living with the producers and directors now for, oh, many years, do you come away with an undying gratitude toward them, or can you think of some things you might like to see changed? Well, um, it's a very touchy spot with me because uh, I have uh, discovered <laughs> a sort of latent hatred for injustice, and uh, I feel that uh, it's been going on for such a long time, particularly with um, producers that there is a lot of freeloading goes on. You know, a, a period of the making of a film can be anything up to seven, eight months, at least eight months, the time it starts script conferences and shooting and writing and talking and buzzing around the country. In all that time, they can be, uh, have all their accommodation paid, their 
chauffeur-driven cars, all their restaurant bills signed off against the company, and they do live like gangsters. Like gangsters? Like gangsters. Well, I, I met a gangster or two myself from time to time, you know. Yeah. But, uh, well, let me ask you this. Are they the kind of people, in your experience, that finding they've got a tremendous smash, which nobody could have anticipated, and are raking in, oh, I think, $10 million on one picture they got, Goldfinger. Do they come around and say, well, Sean, uh, well, you did a terrific job and you bid low on your contract, so we're going to spread this around and cut it up, or uh, tend to put it all in their own pockets? Well, I'm not going to get involved in that scene uh, because it's uh, really too near the bone for, uh, for me on record. Um, but I think there's a lot to be decided. I'll say this here and now, that if there is a producer, be it male or female or a bit of both in this world, who will give a fair deal to any actor, actress, or someone who's a bit of both. He'll get every actor, actress, and a bit of both throughout the whole world to work for them for any amount if they're fair. And I've never heard anybody say that about producers. You haven't met one yet? Well, uh, yes, I, I must say, I've got to try that because uh, uh, Jerry Hellman, who did a fine madness with me, was nothing but, nothing but fair. Well, do you think in this industry as a whole, where there is so much potential money, if things work out, that actors are really well protected? No, I don't think they're protected at all. One of the problems, of course, is that one gets so, uh, as my wife says, emotional, which is true, and um, if one can only switch the hats so that you say, well, here I am, uh, I've got my producer's hat on, or my agent hat, or my actor hat, or my business hat, or my writer hat, or what have you, uh, and people will be able to uh, accept it on these terms of you wearing your particular hats, then you could safeguard yourself. But so many actors just get clobbered left, right, and center. I think the only one who's, who seems to be able to protect himself uh, to a degree is uh, Charlie Chaplin, you know, who, um, he writes, composes, directs, produces, acts, and all these things, and has had a terrible battle. And when you uh, consider the amount of work or fighting he's had to do to protect it, just gives you an, an idea of what you, sort of guts and stamina you need to come through on the other side. Well, in addition to being an actor, of course, Charlie Chaplin has directed, and uh, I understand that you have some thoughts in that direction or have done a bit yourself, is that right? Yes, that's true. I you do. hope to be a, a director when you hang up your actor's hat or even while you're doing it? Oh, that. no, no. I, I don't uh, want really to get too pigeonholed at all. Actually, I've directed a, an hour of television in 10 days in Scotland this year on labor management and justice in Scotland on Red Clydeside, a thing called Bowler and the Bonnet, which I don't think would be of any real interest in America, but uh, it's... Um, very much in the news here in, in, in Britain because there's a man, Ian Stewart, studying an experiment of something that's never happened in the history of England or Scotland or anywhere in, this, in the home countries, and that is where labor, uh, trade unions, uh, capitalists, and government uh, have got equal shares in a shipyard. It's a new trinity, an experiment which has gone on for uh, it's now 18 months, and they're really in fantastic shape. And this is a film sequence you directed? Yeah. An hour program? It's, yeah, well, it's gone, all the, all the televisions have bought it. It's been shown in Scotland, and now all the other stations in Britain have bought it. Do you think if you do get into uh, directing or even producing that you'll become a gangster, or perhaps remember the days when you too were an actor? Well, I'd like to think I can remember it. I'm co-producing a film at the moment that's Western, and I'm going to co-produce it. I see. So I should get some experience in that film. I rather get the impression that although you, you have enjoyed uh, perhaps the wildest success in the history of cinema by being James Bond, that you're sick of the character, sick of the whole business, and don't even admire him anymore. Is that true? Well, I don't have such a uh, factual image of the character of James Bond as many other people seem to have, you know. So um, I don't hate in that sense. It's, um, as I say, some sort of Frankenstein, and uh, I, it's, I just wish that I had the uh, knowledge and experience when I started that I have now. But do you have it now. If you had it to do all over again, know exactly what was laid out for you and what you had to go through to get it, do you think you would again become James Bond or would you... Uh, oh, well, that would have... I mean, what I'm talking about, all, uh, the experience I'm talking about, only uh, took 
place because of the James Bond. I mean, I was put into a situation and situ or other situations that I wouldn't normally have done as an actor. I mean, the thing is that one thing here in this country, um, you do, you can go on doing television and theater and radio and films. Uh, like I was doing before I did the, the Bond films. I mean, I did the Miller's Crucible and Alexander's, uh, Alexander the Great Terence Rattigan's plays and uh, Henri's plays. I did the Greek plays at Oxford in the theatre. She would do French plays in the West End here. For years before I ever was involved in films, you know? Well, you can get all these things happening here. I suppose, you know, it's odd, but most of the great acting these days seems to be coming from England. We've Peter O'Toole and Albert Finney and a host of others are dominating the, the entire uh, field. Do you see any reason for that? Is the training better? Or what is the explanation? Well, I think it's partly sociological that there's a breakthrough. Most definitely, the, um, as I say, one of, one of the problems is that the, that the um, non-realization in this country particularly, that, then, that this is a country that's no longer a great predominant power in the world and uh, this affects everything in the country. And so many of the big houses in the States that are owned by these people that are, have to open them to the public to let them see it, um, is this a proof that they cannot live any longer on these terms unless you have a fantastic amount of money. And these people are becoming fewer and fewer. Therefore, there's a breakthrough uh, on all so social levels. Therefore, they will produce um, actors who are not going to um, accept. Um, I mean, it's such a misconception of an actor. When you see some of the old films that he should be with a, a grand piano with uh, uh, candles, uh, candelabra and uh, fantastic uh, table lights and Renoirs and Picassos and, and this sort of thing, and dressing for dinner, now, that isn't on. Mm. I mean, the actor, I mean, it doesn't matter who it is, talking about basically theater actor like Schofield or um, Albert, uh, Finney or, or Tool or any of the boys at all are not about to try and project this image or retain this kind of image because it's a way of life that's like a facsimile. Well, this is the era in which you've come along. Do you, do you think that this attitude or set of circumstances is in some way responsible for your own success? Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. You know, there's no, there's, you know, there's no, no doubt about it that there's a, um, a sort of renaissance sort of, that's happening in this country, maybe economically in, <laughs> in Stuck, but uh, I think that out of it is going to come uh, a much more lively country if it comes uh, soon enough. Speaking of economics, I, uh, <clears throat> I have a sixpence here. Oh, Can we good. play the game? You're on. Okay. You realize when I pull this handle, you have 20 minutes. Cut. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice. Before we do the ticking business, that's very, very good. We just do a couple. Good company, act three, take two. I'll uh, come up with a sixpence, Sean, but before you get it, let me ask you a couple questions. You know, I first saw you, let's see, oh, five or six years ago, and it was across a table just about like this, and it was a film called Dr. No, and all of a sudden the camera came in and they were sitting and you gave your name as Bond, James Bond. I remember the tone exactly. From that moment on, you became James Bond, were James Bond, and you've been James Bond through five smash hits so far. How long are you going to go on being James Bond? Uh, well, as long as they keep uh, releasing and re-releasing the films that I've made, but as far as I'm concerned, I finished with the James Bond. You're not going to do uh, any more movies as James Bond? Uh, no. I've stated my terms that I would take uh, one million pounds tax-free to do another one. One million pounds tax-free? Yes. Is there that much money in the United Kingdom? Yes, there is. I take it you, you put those terms uh, having in mind that nobody was going to come up with it? Uh, yes, certainly. I don't think anybody would pay that amount. Are you a little sick of doing James Bond, do you think? Well, 
Well, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, I've had uh, six years, uh, five films playing that same part, and as far as being a, an actor is concerned, it uh, begins to go off a bit. Uh, and also, it's very difficult to compare it with anything else because I don't think there's been any other films that uh, have created such a uh, phenomena as the James Bond. Well, there's nothing like it in history, but your, your most recent film was You Only Live Twice, which I believe was set yeah. in the Orient. Did you feel as you went through that, as you made the film, that the edge was going a little bit, you no longer were quite as sharp as the super spy? Well, um, I felt I was... Uh, reasonably sharp. The important thing is to have stamina of a football player, which, you know, I have. But uh, it's, been, it's six months in the making, yeah. that, that film. I was sharp enough, but I mean, there's only so many things one can do as far as the character is concerned. And, you know, they sort of... Do you get the uh, feeling that you were running through the same sequence that you'd done before another film? Well, yes. I mean, you've got to cater a bit for the aficionados who are going to watch them, you know, who get the little sort of quirks and things. So they have to be a bit more subtle and a bit more edged humor and what have you, you know. That's what uh, you have to sort of go for and uh, keep alive. Um, and, and then there isn't a great deal of character development as such. You know, it would be different if one took um, any of the classical parts and put them in a different st uh, situation over a period of five years and put them in different situations. You could perhaps see something because of uh, some particular magnitude. You know, one of the, one of the things that all of us uh admire and probably envy a little bit about this role that you've been playing. It's all the wonderful gadgets that you get. You get a, an Aston Martin car with uh, oh, oil slicks and machine guns and ejection seats and you get a little yeah. gyrocopter that can shoot down half of the uh, air force that yeah. the enemy is putting up. Do you ever wish that you had these gadgets or do you ever play with them yourself off, uh, off the set? No, I'm, I have no great uh, fascination for that sort of thing. I, I, I like the, the gyrocopter. I thought that was rather marvelous and you only live twice. Only because of the man, I think who um, built it and flew it all over Japan, and uh, he was rather marvelous. That actually did fly, those oh, yes, things that, were real. You know, that's, that's authentic, and, uh, but as far as gadgets like cars are concerned, and fantastic volcanoes and these extraordinary things, are, they, they've sort of developed and developed, and they've got away from the, uh, the, the sort of personal aspect of the films, which I liked, uh, say, and uh, my favorite one, which is, uh, from Russia with love. I think now he's got to walk on the water or do something like, you know, the equivalent. I suppose you're right. Um, this character, James Bond, was created by Ian Fleming long before there were any movies, and he already was pretty well sold to a lot of people. Now, when it came to picking an actor to fit into that role, there must have been some pretty careful scrutinizing. How were you picked? Was it a competition or did a lot of people try out or what happened? Well, um, I know that um, Fleming had some say in it with um, Saltzman and Broccoli and Bud Ornstein then he was with UA and they had, uh, they called and they'd seen other actors and talked about other actors and then they eventually met and, and talked with myself. They, in the final um, days they said they wanted to do a test which I refused to do because uh, I had been acting for eight years up to then, and you know, it was um, nothing like on the sort of worldwide uh, scale, but most certainly in Britain, uh, as an actor of stature from the theater and television mm -hmm. and films. You must have uh, met and spent some time with Ian Fleming, is that true? Yes, yeah. Did you find that he was really, in his own mind, James Bond, that this is the life he wanted to lead if he could have led it? Well, I, I, um, I, th I think there's a, a, a mixture. He, I liked Ian. Um, he, had a, he had a marvelous brain, marvelous curiosity, and he was great fun, uh, very witty, very dry, a bit too English for me, but uh, still fine. Um, but uh, as far as the, uh, the Bond guys was concerned, I felt that uh, he missed slightly in the... Um, the uh, humorous aspect. Well, you, you, you did have a, a sense of humor in these pictures, sometimes uh, amounting to a grin, right, while you were plugging somebody through the heart. Is this something that was written into his books and you found, or is it something that you introduced yourself? No, he, he wrote these the sort of lines, like, you know, I'll make another move and I'll give you another navel, um, which was, I think, one of the only funny line, actually, that was in Dr. Noor from Russia with love. I'm not sure because I only read these two. But um, he was 
not a humorous writer, as humorous as he was himself. He was uh, very dry and, and witty no. himself. Did you sit down with Ian and, and work up this part or create it, or do you, do you think that your own personality, as it had already developed before you became James Bond, really put the sock into it, so to speak? Well, no, I used everything that was uh, within my compass to uh, um, imbue the, the character or uh, add to it, you know, the um, agility and running and action and fight scenes and boats and things, all the things that one can do uh, well, which I can do well, you know, plus the um, delivery of these sort of lines and things. Well, in the course of producing five great big motion pictures, you must have had a lot to do with uh, those creatures behind the scenes that we hear of whose names we see called directors and producers. Do you, uh, do you come away from those five films with any <clears throat> attitudes toward producers or directors in either case? Uh, well, I had nothing but, uh, out of the five, four very good relationships with di directors. That was no problem. Uh, the, the producers, I felt, left um, a bit to be desired. Um, uh, it's the old story that if I uh, knew then what I know now, I most certainly uh, would have behaved differently. Well, what do you know now that you didn't know that you think might have put you in better stead if you'd had the benefit of the experience? Well, um, not to go off on a sort of emotional tack and to put the hat on that fits the situation, such as now is the time you talk to my agent, not me, uh, and a few little sort of devices like that. Which might wear the business man's hat. Well, yeah, dealing particularly with the business side, which is the type, that, the side that always gets the actor clobbered. What do the producers do in these pictures? Do they put it together? Do they arrange the scenes? What is their function? Well, it's, um, you mean in these particular pictures? Yes. Well, I think you should really do another program on them, actually. Well, you're probably right, but what do you see the producers do? Let me take your uh, evidence, as it were. Well, um... Let's say this, what I object to is uh, injustice in a form of freeloading. And that is, um, during the making of a film, there's a long period of say eight, 10 months, where there's uh, dinners to be signed off against production and running around in cars with chauffeurs and uh, virtually living like gangsters. And in that time, you can also set up other deals, other films or whatever you want to be interested in. Did you manage to avoid living like a gangster when you were on location? Um, meaning no disrespect to gangsters. I have no desire at all to live like a gangster. Well, I bump into them occasionally myself from time to time. You, uh, you certainly have made, or oh, I suppose it's without parallel, there is nothing in film history or in any history that I can think of to uh, parallel the James Bond smash to success. Uh, I assume that the financial returns have uh, made you a week's pay from time to time, but looking back now, let's say you had to do it all over again. Somebody came along and you had the benefit of all these five pictures and they said, Sean, we want you to play James Bond. Would you do it? Yes. You uh, are tired of the fellow now, but nonetheless willing to, I take it. Well, uh, you're taking it back. You're taking it back to the to, to six years previous. Yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah, well, yes, most But certainly. with the benefit of what you now know. No, no, absolutely, yeah. Because I feel that everybody who does the work should get paid in everything. Well, I take it that if you had to do it all over again, you might rewrite the contract somewhat differently than they were written. Somewhat, yes. Well, do you think anyone could possibly have anticipated just how far these films would go or how much money they would make? Nobody did, but nobody. Nobody's that smart. Mm. Well, I suppose if you did it all over again, you'd have the benefit of that... Uh, yeah, but particular else retrospect. <laughs> yes, everyone else would too, you're right. The acting scene seems to me, and this is perhaps a private opinion, but it seems to be dominated by Englishmen these days. Albert Finney is a smash hit, and Peter O'Toole was a smash hit. Do you think there's better training over here, a more sincere purpose? Why is it that this is so? Well, um, there's a couple of reasons. I think, I think one of the reasons is a simple geographical reason is that everything can take place in a 25-mile radius. That's theater films, television, radio. And um, you can do a film during the day in a theater at night if you particularly want to. 
That's one of the reasons. And the other reasons, I think, um, is probably sociological, in that um, many breakthroughs have been made in this uh, country with changes in attitudes and uh, red brick universities and uh, our Olympic Games representatives are no longer from Oxford or Cambridge, but uh, from anywhere. And I hope, I'd like to think that they were all really picked because they were the best. The best actors? Or the best runners or the best. Oh, I see. Well, many people think, of course, that you popped out of the woodwork or some steel mill uh, to become James Bond, but as a matter of fact, you've done a lot of acting before that, some of it on the stage, isn't that so? Yes. Do you think that if you had not had all of this experience, that you would not have gotten the part, or having gotten it, that you would not have made it what it became? I feel like in the witness box, I missed that. <laughs> Well, let me take you out of the witness box. Yeah. Let's suppose that you had had very limited experience. What I'm really trying to find out is, yeah. was James Bond so beautifully created for your own personality that you would have fit into it? Oh, without, without the experience? Without the experience. Time. No, I don't think so, no. The, one, of the, one of the most important things that one learned in the theatre particularly is being able to stand still. And uh, like one of the Greek plays I did in blank verse in Oxford, I had uh, like two and a half pages of blank verse to start with. And if you can do that before uh, 900 or 1,000 people, you can do it uh, in front of a camera. You uh, are going back really to the kind of acting that you did before James Bond and the kind that you did during James Bond in The, the Hill and The Fine Madness, two films that were very well reviewed but can't touch a Bond picture for box office. Do you have any fear or trepidation that these will not be a success or that the public will not accept you as anything other than James Bond? Well, I mean, I can't um, answer that uh, really for the public. I can only answer it for myself in that it's impossible to compare a film like The Hill or like A Fine Madness to one of the Bond films. I mean, uh, I can't think of a film offhand that what was considered a phenomenal success like um, what's a bridge on the River Kwai, which was in colour with all big names and things. Suddenly, you, you get a film like uh, Thunderball, and it makes four and five times the amount of money. Therefore, to try and compare something like The Hill with it, um, it's, it's just, as I said before, a phenomenon that, that doesn't you know, bear comparison. So, I, you know, I, I, it won't stop me from making films like The, the Hill and A Fine Madness. And I'm glad to say that the only place that really seemed to like A uh, Fine Madness was New York, where it was set. But they did like it. You know, yeah. speaking of uh, money, I still have my sixpence here. Are you uh, ready to play that game now? Yes. How about pulling the handle? All right. That's only good for 20 minutes. <laughs> 